Welcome to another Zeppelin video. Now we want to approach a huge topic. The most successful airship the world has ever seen. The Zeppelin, which flew around the world and crossed the Atlantic 140 times, filled with hydrogen and without a single accident. The LZ-127. I researched in a lot of old German books written by the crew, designers and captains of the LZ-127. I went to the places in Germany where it was designed and based and I used old blueprints to redesign it in Katia, which revealed many hidden details. So let's go through this step by step. In the last part we learned everything about the LZ-126, the airship the Zeppelin company built for the USA who was not allowed to pay for it. Instead Germany had to build it on their own cost as reparation for the First World War. The USA helped Germany, against the desire of France and Britain, to keep the Zeppelin company alive, to keep their buildings, especially the hangars, and they supported Germany to build Zeppelins again after the First World War. So Germany delivered the LZ-126 to the United States in 1924 and was welcomed with a huge ticker tape parade. The LZ-126 was the best project to build friendly relationships with the USA again after the war and LZ-126 was to become the most successful American airship, then named ZR-3. So it left a very good impression, because all other US projects to get a reliable airship, buying the best Italian ship, buying one from Britain, or building their own airship, failed, either before or during service. In the following years, the USA persuaded France and Britain to lift restrictions on German aviation industry. So the Zeppelin company was free to build their own large Zeppelin again. But the problem was, the 1920s were hard in Germany after losing the war because of political instability with the new democracy and huge inflation. The Zeppelin company simply didn't have the money for building a large airship. But they had a vision for the future. They wanted to build a frequent transatlantic connection with Zeppelins. Because in the 1920s planes couldn't go that far yet and ships needed a week for one direction. So similar to the wonder of Echterding in 1908 when, to the surprise of the Zeppelin company, the German people donated millions to build new Zeppelins, they now tried to get additional funding through donations again. It was called the Zeppelin Egner Donation, named after Zeppelin and his successor and was a series of presentations in whole Germany to inform the public what this new Zeppelin could do. For example, they talked about exploring the North Pole with this Zeppelin. They were able to collect 2.5 million Reichsmark through these donations, but that wasn't enough. Egner could then persuade the German state in these difficult times to contribute 1.1 million Reichsmark. 800,000 Reichsmark came from the Zeppelin GmbH and later on the German state gave another 500,000 Reichsmark for insurance and the first test flights. But even with that, they knew the money wouldn't be enough for long trips and hence they decided to design the Zeppelin to also take passengers who pay for the flight. And that was the general challenge of this project. They didn't really know what they will use this Zeppelin for in the following years, so they tried to be prepared for everything. On one hand, it was an experimental Zeppelin where they would include all the latest ideas and innovations. On the other hand, they wanted to take as much passengers and cargo as possible to earn money with the flights. And another big challenge was, the biggest hangar in Friedrichshafen was not big enough and compromised the Zeppelin's design. They used the whole length of the hangar, which resulted in 236.6 meters. They used the whole width of the hangar and only left one meter gap on each side. And when they pulled the Zeppelin out, hovering close to the ground, there was only little over half a meter gap at the top. The result was a structure with 17 sections for gas bags. The largest sections had a diameter of 30.5 meters. And this was the big advantage of rigid airships, the same as for watertight compartments in a ship. If one leaks, the ship can still fly and you can go to the damaged cell and repair it while flying. Each ring had 28 edges and consisted of a new improved beam structure and a new improved dual aluminium. That was the first big improvement. That's an alloy of aluminium and copper and while it's the same name as for previous Zeppelins, it's the same weight, but now for the LZ-127, 20% stronger. 
For comparison, they now reach the same strength as steel, but with only 30% of the weight. The second big improvement that came with the LZ127 was its middle catwalk. So instead of only a catwalk at the bottom, they now designed an additional triangular structure from nose to tail that made it easier to maintain gas cells, but more importantly, it significantly reinforced the structure. The next revolutionary innovation was the use of gas to power the engines instead of fuel. A problem of Zeppelin so far was that they needed to carry huge amounts of fuel for their long trips. But if they burn tons of fuel during the flight, they are too light when they want to land, which means they either collect ballast during flight with rainwater or exhaust gas condensation or stop to collect water from the ocean. Or they need to release lots of hydrogen for landing. But that means that they need to refuel huge amounts of hydrogen to take off again and you need to find an airfield that can provide so much hydrogen. So instead they now used a gas called Blaugas, named after its inventor Hermann Blau. This gas replaced the toxic city gas in the early 1900s, which was used for street lamps and light towers before. In the 1920s propane got more popular and Blaugas lost its significance. But now the Zeppelin company discovered Blaugas, which had great properties and around the same density as air. So it didn't matter anymore if the Zeppelin was filled up with gas for its engines or not. The lift of the Zeppelin stayed the same. There was a huge advantage because the heavy concentrated loads of fuel barrels were gone, so it was a lot less stress for the structure again and they could take huge amounts of gas in the Zeppelin, which increased range. So we learned in my LZ126 videos that France and Britain stopped their earlier project to build a Zeppelin for the USA with 100,000 cubic meter gas volume. Because that would have been double the size of previous war Zeppelins and a lot bigger than their own. So LZ126 was limited to 70,000 cubic meters. But because it was smaller they could create a perfect streamlined shape, which reduced drag. For LZ127 there were no restrictions anymore, just the hangar size in Friedrichshafen. So they had to find a compromise between perfect aerodynamic shape and gas volume. In the end they decided a bit more for gas volume, so they could fly longer and take more cargo, but the ship was compromised and hence drag was a bit higher than it could have been, so LZ127 was a bit slower. Finally, LZ127 had a gas volume of 105,000 cubic meters. But here we have to be careful because it's getting a bit more complicated than in other Zeppelins. And it was the first and only time they built it that way. The 105,000 cubic meters is the overall gas volume, so blau gas plus hydrogen. Because there is just one picture of the cross section, I redesigned that arrangement to give you a better idea. We have 17 gas bags for hydrogen and the 12 largest sections have a cell for blau gas underneath. Now it's also convenient to have the center catwalk to be able to maintain both gas cells, one above, one below. Now that we designed all 29 gas cells roughly, we can also measure their volume and we get pretty close to the 105,000 cubic meters overall. And we can see that roughly 30,000 cubic meters are blau gas and 75,000 cubic meters are hydrogen. So the hydrogen volume is just slightly more than on LZ126, but not as much as you would think when you compare the size of the two. We need to keep in mind here that the LZ127 doesn't need large amounts of lift to carry liquid fuel. So when we are calculating lift of LZ127, we cannot use the overall gas volume like for any other Zeppelin. Nevertheless, the German aviation authorities were not convinced by the gas-powered system and first test flights had to be done with standard petrol fuel. From the third flight onwards, LZ127 used Blaugas, which had the other advantage that it is less flammable than petrol fumes. Actually, the gas idea was not new. In 1872, German airship builder Hähnlein used gas to power the engine. But in his case, the same gas that produced lift, city gas. So during the flight, while the engine was burning the gas, the airship lost lift and he tried to balance that by blowing hot air into the hull. But that's another story. Anyway, during the build time of LZ127, more than 200,000 people visited the factory and it gave Friedrichshafen in the south another tourist attraction. 
Stay tuned for the next episode where we will discover more technical details of LZ127.